Chapter 17 of The Dream Doctor. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Vi Griswold. ViGriswold.com. The Dream Doctor by Arthur B. Reeve. Chapter 17 The Bomb Maker. We stared at each other in blank awe, at the various parts so innocent-looking in the heaps on the table, now safely separated, but together a combination ticket to perdition. "'Who do you suppose could have sent it?' I blurted out when I found my voice then, suddenly recollecting the political and legal fight the Carton was engaged in at the time. I added, "'The white slavers?' "'Not a doubt,' he returned laconically. "'And?' he exclaimed, bringing both hands down vigorously in characteristic emphasis on the arms of his chair. I've got to win this fight against the Vice Trust, as I call it, or the whole work of the District Attorney's Office in clearing up the city will be discredited. To say nothing of the risk the present incumbent runs at having such grateful friends about the city send marks of their affection and esteem like this. I knew something already of the situation, and Carton continued thoughtfully, all the powers of vice are fighting a last-ditch battle against me now. I think I am on the trail of the man or men higher up in this commercialized vice business, and it is a business, big business, too. You know, I suppose that they seem to have a string of hotels in the city, of the worst character. There is nothing that they will stop at to protect themselves. Why, they are using gangs of thugs to terrorize anyone who informs on them. The gunmen, of course, hate a snitch worse than poison. There have been bomb outrages, too. Nearly a bomb a day lately, against some of those who look shaky and seem to be likely to do business with my office. But I'm getting closer all the time. How do you mean? Asked Kennedy. Well, one of the best witnesses, if I can break him down by pressure and promises, ought to be a man named Haddon, who is running a place in the 50s known as the Mayfair. Haddon knows all these people. I can get him in half an hour if you think it worthwhile. Not here, but somewhere uptown, say at the Prince Henry. Kennedy nodded. We had heard of Haddon before, a notorious character in the White Light District. A moment later, Carton had telephoned to the Mayfair and had found Haddon. How did you get him so that he is even considering turning state's evidence? Asked Craig. Well, answered Carton slowly, I suppose it was partly through a cabaret singer and dancer, Lorraine Keith at the Mayfair. You know, you never get the truth about things in the underworld except in pieces. As much as anyone, I think we have been able to use her to weave a web about him. Besides, she seems to think that Haddon has treated her shamefully. According to her story, he seems to have been lavishing everything on her, but lately, for some reason, has deserted her. Still, even in her jealousy, she does not accuse any other woman of winning him away. Per perhaps it is the opposite, another man winning her, suggested Craig dryly. It's a peculiar situation, shrugged Carton. There is another man. As nearly as I can make out, there is a fellow named Brody who does a dance with her. But he seems to annoy her, yet at the same time exercises a sort of fascination over her. Then she is dancing at the Mayfair yet? Hastily asked Craig. Yes, I told her to stay, not to excite suspicion. And had a nose? No, no. But he's told us enough about him already so that we can worry him, apparently. Just as what he can tell us would worry the others interested in the hotels. To tell the truth, I think she is a drug fiend. When my men tell me that they have seen her take just a sniff of something and change instantly, become a willing tool. That's the way it happens, commented Kennedy. Now, I'll have to go up there and meet Haddon, resumed Carton. After I've been with him long enough to get into his confidence, suppose you two just happen along. Half an hour later, Kennedy and I sauntered into the Prince Henry, where Carton had made the appointment in order to avoid suspicion that might arise if he were seen with Haddon at the Mayfair. The two men were waiting for us. Haddon, by contrast with Carton, a weak-faced, nervous man with bulgy eyes. Mr. Haddon, introduced Carton, let me present a couple of reporters from the Star. Off duty, so that we can talk freely before them, I can assure you. Good fellows, too, Haddon. 
The hotel and cabaret keeper smiled a sickly smile and greeted us with a covert, questioning glance. This attack on Mr. Carton has unnerved me. He shivered. If anyone dares to do that to him, what will they do to me? Don't get cold feet, Haddon, urged Carton. You'll be all right. I'll swing it for you. Haddon made no reply. At length, he remarked, You'll excuse me for a moment. I must telephone to my hotel. He entered a booth in the shadow of the back of the cafe, where there was a slot machine pay station. I think Haddon has his suspicions, remarked Carton, although he is too prudent to say anything yet. A moment later, he returned. Something seemed to have happened. He looked less nervous. His face was brighter and his eyes clearer. What was it, I wondered. Could it be that he was playing a game with Carton and had given him a double cross? I was quite surprised at his next remark. Carton, he said confidently. I'll stick. Good, exclaimed the district attorney, and they fell into a conversation in low tones. By the way, drawled Kennedy, I must telephone to the office in case they need me. He had risen and entered the same booth. Haddon and Carton were still talking earnestly. It was evident that, for some reason, Haddon had lost his former halting manner. Perhaps, I reasoned, the bomb episode had, after all, thrown a scare into him, and he felt that he needed protection against his own associates, who were quick to discover such dealings as Carton had forced him into. I rose and lounged back to the booth at Kennedy. Whom did he call? I whispered, when Craig emerged perspiring from the booth, for I knew that that was his purpose. Craig glanced at Haddon, who now seemed absorbed in talking to Carton. No one, he answered quickly. Central told me there had not been a call from this pay station for half an hour. No one, I echoed almost incredulously. Then what did he do? Something happened, all right. Kennedy was evidently engrossed in his own thoughts, for he said nothing. Haddon says he wants to do some scouting about, announced Carton when we rejoined them. There are several people whom he says he might suspect. I've arranged to meet him this afternoon to get the first part of this story about the inside working of the Vice Trust, and he will let me know if anything develops then. You'll be at your office? Yes, one or the other of us, returned Craig in a tone which Haddon could not hear. In the meantime, we took occasion to make some inquiries of our own about Haddon and Lorraine Keith. They were evidently well known in the circle in which they traveled. Haddon had many curious characteristics, chief of which to interest Kennedy was his speed mania. Time and again he had been arrested for exceeding the speed limit in taxi cabs and in a car of his own, often in the past with Lorraine Keith, but lately, alone. It was toward the close of the afternoon that Carton called up hurriedly. As Kennedy hung up the receiver, I read on his face that something had gone wrong. Haddon has disappeared, he announced, mysteriously and suddenly, without leaving so much as a clue. It seems that he found in his office a package exactly like that which was sent to Carton earlier in the day. He didn't wait to say anything about it, but left. Carton is bringing it over here. Perhaps a quarter of an hour later, Carton himself deposited the package on the laboratory table with an air of relief. We looked eagerly. It was addressed to Haddon at the Mayfair in the same disguised handwriting and was done up in precisely the same fashion. Lots of bombs are just scare bombs, observed Craig. But you never can tell. Again, Kennedy had started to dissect. Ah, he went on. This is the real thing, though only a little different from the other. A dry battery gives a spark when the lid is slipped back. See, the explosive is in a steel pipe. Sliding the lid off is supposed to explode it. Why, there is enough explosive in this to have silenced a dozen Haddons. Do you think he could have been kidnapped or murdered? I asked. What is this anyhow? Gang war? Or perhaps bribe? Suggested Carton. I can't say, ruminated Kennedy. But I can say this that there is at large in this city a man of great mechanical skill and practical knowledge of electricity and explosives. He is trying to make sure of hiding something from exposure. We must find him. And especially Haddon, Carton added quickly. He is the missing link. His testimony is absolutely essential to the case I'm building up. I think I shall want to observe Lauren Keith without being observed, planned Kennedy with a hasty glance at his watch. I think I'll drop around at this Mayfair I've heard so much about. Will you come? I'd better not refused Carton. You know they all know me and everything quits wherever I go. I'll see you soon. As we drove in a cab over to the Mayfair, Kennedy said nothing. I wondered how and where Haddon had disappeared. Had the powers of evil in the city learned that he was weakening and hurried him out of the way at the last moment? Just what had Lorraine Keith to do with it? 
Was she in any way responsible? I felt that there were indeed no bounds to what a jealous woman might dare. Beside the ornate grilled doorway of the carriage entrance of the Mayfair stood a gilt and black easel with the words, Tango Tea at Four. Although it was considerably after that time, there was a line of taxicabs before the place and, inside, a brave array of late afternoon and early evening revelers. The public dancing had ceased and a cabaret had taken its place. We entered and sat down at one of the more inconspicuous of the little round tables. On a stage at one side, a girl was singing one of the latest syncopated airs. "'We'll just stick around a while, Walter,' whispered Craig. "'Perhaps this Lorian Keith will come in.' Behind us, protected both by the music and the rustle of people coming and going, a couple talked in low tones. Now and then a word floated over to me in a language which was English, sure enough, but not of a kind that I could understand. Drop by a flatty, I caught once, then something about a mouthpiece and the bowls and making a plant. A dip, pickpocket and his girl, or gun mole as they call them, translated Kennedy. One of their number has evidently been picked up by a detective and he looks to them for a good lawyer or mouthpiece. Besides these two, there were innumerable other interesting glimpses into the life of this meeting place for the half and underworlds. A motion in the audience attracted me as if some favorite performer were about to appear, and I heard the gun mole whisper, Lorraine Keith. There she was, a petite, dark-haired, snappy-eyed girl, chic, well-groomed, and gowned so daringly that every woman in the audience envied, and every man craned his neck to see her better. Lorraine wore a tight-fitting black dress, slashed to the knee. In fact, everything was calculated to set her off at best advantage, and on the stage, at least, there was something recherche about her. Yet, there was also something gross about her, too. Accompanying her was a nervous-looking fellow whose washed-out face was particularly unattractive. It seemed as if the bone in his nose was going, due to the shrinkage of the blood vessels. Once, just before the dance began, I saw him rub something on the back of his hand, raise it to his nose, and then sniff. Then he took a sip of a liqueur. The dance began, wild from the first step, and as it developed, Kennedy leaned over and whispered, The dance day a posh. It was acrobatic. The man expressed brutish passion and jealousy. The woman? Affection and fear. It seemed to tell a story. The struggle of love. The love of the woman against the brutal instincts of the thug, her lover. She was terrified as well as fascinated by him and his mad temper and tremendous superhuman strength. I wondered if the dance portrayed the fact. The music was a popular air with many rapid changes, but through all there was a constant rhythm which accorded well with the abandon of the swaying dance. Indeed, I could think of nothing so much as Bill Sykes and Nancy as I watched these two. It was the fight of two frenzied young animals. He would approach stealthily, seize her, and whirl her about, lifting her to his shoulder. She was agile, docile, and fearful. He untied a scarf and passed it about her. She leaned against it, and they whirled giddily about. Suddenly, it seemed that he became jealous. She would run, he follow and catch her. She would try to pacify him. He would become more enraged. The dance became faster and more furious. His violent effort seemed to throw her to the floor, and her streaming hair now made it seem more like a fight than a dance. The audience hung breathless. It ended with her dropping exhausted, a proper finale to this lowest and most brutal dance. Panting, flushed, with an unnatural light in their eyes, they descended to the audience and, scorning the roar of applause to repeat the performance, sat at a little table. I saw a couple of girls come over toward the man. "'Give us a deck, Coke,' said one in a harsh voice. He nodded. A silver quarter gleamed momentarily from hand to hand, and he passed to one girl stealthily a small white paper packet. Others came to him, both men and women. It seemed to be an established thing. "'Who is that?' asked Kennedy in a low tone, with a pickpocket back of us. "'Coke Brody,' was the laconic reply. "'The cocaine fiend?' "'Yes.' and a lobby gown for the grapevine system of selling the dope under this new law. "'Where does he get the supply to sell?' asked Kennedy, casually. The pickpocket shrugged his shoulders. "'No one knows, I suppose,' Kennedy commented to me. "'But he gets it in spite of the added restrictions and peddles it in little packets, adulterated, and at a fabulous price for such cheap stuff. The habit is spreading like wildfire. It is a fertile means of recruiting the inmates in the vice-trust hotels. A veritable epidemic it is, too.' Cocaine is one of the most harmful of all habit-forming drugs. It used to be a habit of the underworld, but now it is creeping up, and gradually and surely reaching the higher strata of society. One thing that causes its spread is the ease with which it can be taken. It requires no smoking dens, 
No syringe. No paraphernalia. Only the drug itself. Another singer had taken the place of the dancers. Kennedy leaned over and whispered to the dip. Say, do you and your gun mole want to pick up a piece of change to get that mouthpiece I heard you talking about? The pickpocket looked at Craig suspiciously. Oh, don't worry. I'm all right, laughed Craig. You see that fellow, Coke Brody? I want to get something on him. If you will frame that sucker to get away with the whole front, there's a fifty in it. The dip looked, rather than spoke, his amazement. Apparently Kennedy satisfied his suspicions. I'm on, he said quickly. When he goes, I'll follow him. You keep behind us and we'll deliver the goods. What's it all about? I whispered. Why, he answered, I want to get Brody. Only I don't want to figure in the thing so that he will know me or suspect anything but a plain hold-up. They will get him. Take everything he has. There must be something on that man that will help us. Several performers had done their turns, and the supply of the drugs seemed to have been exhausted. Brody rose and, with a nod to Lorraine, went out, unsteadily, now that the effect of the cocaine had worn off. One wondered how this shuffling person could ever have carried through the wild dance. It was not Brody who danced. It was the drug. The dip slipped out after him, followed by the woman. We rose and followed also. Across the city, Brody slouched his way, with an evident purpose, it seemed, of replenishing his supply and continuing his round of peddling the stuff. He stopped under the brow of a thickly populated tenement row on the Upper East Side, as though this was his destination. There he stood at the gate that led down to his cellar, looking up and down as if wondering whether he was observed. We had slunk into a doorway. A woman coming down the street, swinging a chatelaine, walked close to him, spoke, and for a moment they talk. That's the gun mole, remarked Kennedy. She's getting Brody off his guard. This must be the root of that grapevine system, as they call it. Suddenly, from the shadow of the next house, a stealthy figure sprang out on Brody. It was our dip, a dip no longer but a regular stick-up man, with a gun jammed into the face of his victim and a broad hand over his mouth. Skillfully, the woman went through Brody's pockets, her nimble fingers missing not a thing. Now beat it, we heard the dip whisper hoarsely, and if you raise a holler, we'll get you right next time. Brody fled as fast as his weakened nerves would permit his shaky limbs to move. As he disappeared, the dip sent something dark hurtling over the roof of the house across the street and hurried towards us. What was that? I asked. I think it was the pistol on the end of a stout cord. That is a favorite trick of the gunman after a job. It destroys at least a part of the evidence. You can't throw a gun very far alone, you know. But with it at the end of the string, you can lift it up over the roof of a tenement. If Brody squeals to a copper and these people are caught, they can't hold them under the pistol law anyhow. The dip had caught sight of us, with his ferret eyes in the doorway. Quickly, Kennedy passed over the money in return for the motley array of objects taken from Brody. The dip and his gun mold disappeared into the darkness as quickly as they had emerged. There was a curious assortment. The paraphernalia of a drug fiend, old letters, a key, and several other useless articles. The pickpocket had retained the money from the sale of the dope as his own particular honorarium. "'Brody has led us up to the source of his supply,' remarked Kennedy, thoughtfully regarding the stuff. "'And the dip has given us the key to it. Are you game to go in?' A glance up and down the street showed it still deserted. We wormed our way in the shadow to the cellar before which Brody had stood. The outside door was open. We entered, and Craig stealthily struck a match, shading it in his hands. At one end we were confronted by a little door of mystery, barred with iron and held by an innocent enough-looking padlock. It was this lock, evidently, to which the key fitted, opening the way into the subterranean vault of brick and stone. Kennedy opened it and pushed back the door. There was a little square compartment, dark as pitch and delightfully cool and damp. He lighted a match, then hastily blew it out and switched on an electronic bulb which it disclosed. "'Can't afford risks like that here,' he exclaimed, carefully disposing of the match as our eyes became accustomed to the light. On every side were pieces of gas pipe, boxes, and paper. On shelves were jars of various materials. There was a work table littered with tools, pieces of wire, boxes, and scraps of metal. "'My word!' exclaimed Kennedy." as he surveyed the curious scene before us. This is a regular bomb factory, one of the most amazing exhibits that the history of crime has ever produced. End of chapter 17 Recording by Vi Griswold